All right, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome to Grand Rounds, everyone here at the University of Wisconsin. And I am very honored uh, to be able to present our Grand Rounds speaker today. My name is Dr. Betsy Trowbridge, and I am the Executive Vice Chair for the Department of Medicine. So today we have Dr. Amy Zielinski, who will be presenting Grand Rounds entitled Empathy in Medical Education, the Science of Teaching the Art of Medicine, something that we all uh, can learn a lot about and I'm really excited to hear about. Dr. Zielinski, just a little bit about her. She is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of General Internal Medicine. She did her BA in psychology and drama at the other UW, University of Washington, Seattle. And then she came over to our UW after that where she did her master's and her PhD in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis. She has been uh, an incredibly important part of the leadership team for education here at the University of Wisconsin. She currently is the Director of Education and Innovation Scholarship in the Department of Medicine. And her work really revolves around empathy and communication using theater as a medium. She is a highly um, decorated and honored educator and researcher in education. In 2001, she received the Excellence in Education Mentoring Award from the Department of Medicine. In 2008, she was invited to be a participant in the research writing workshop for the early career investigators, for early career investigators, and that was through the European Association for Communication and Healthcare. And in 2017, uh, she became a member of our University of Wisconsin Campus Teaching Academy. Her research uh, is uh, very wide reaching. She has an R01. She's been funded by the National Association for the Arts, uh, as well as the uh, Institute of as well as um, Institute of Medicine. She has 25 peer reviewed articles, over 35 um, national presentations, and seven international presentations. And uh, I'm always inspired by the educational work she does and the times and I've been able to work with her. And so uh, Dr. Zwinski, please come up and present Grand Rounds for us. Thank you, Dr. Trowbridge, so much for that introduction and welcome to Grand Rounds. Welcome to your Friday morning. Thank you so much for spending it a little bit of the time with me. I really appreciate it. Welcome also to folks joining us on Zoom. No matter what you're doing in your life, maybe you're taking a shower or eating breakfast or <laughs> dropping your kids off. So thank you so much for being here with us today. I am going to, of course, do the, I don't have any financial disclosures related to what I'll be talking about today. No off-label uses of empathy. It's actually good all over the place. So <laughs> I think we're good there. Um, I do have a funding disclosure just because I won't be talking about this work, but I am partially funded by some NIH grants, and I have the pleasure of working with Gretchen Swarzy and Chris Quekaboom on these projects. Because empathy permeates everything I do, I feel like that also informs the work that I do with best case, worst case with them as well. So I wanted to start out, you know, I think this is always the hardest part of a talk for me is how do you begin? How do you not just jump in and start going from zero to 60? And I got some great advice from Sarah Kim, who's one of my mentors at University of Washington, to tell you just a little bit about my story, because it might not be the familiar story. You know, somebody who, okay, you studied drama, you were an actor. What the heck are you doing in medical education? <laughs> like, how does that happen? So just a little bit, actually it kind of happened by happenstance. I, you know, I did the acting thing for a while. I loved the work of it. I loved having a role and digging into a character and I hated the lifestyle of it. Auditioning, self-promotion, not something I was really into. Then I started teaching and I realized, whoa, like this is like acting, but a little bit different. Like you're still trying to connect to an audience. You're still trying to like, spur some light bulb moments, but the lifestyle I, was a lot better. So I started, I started to think about, okay, maybe I want to be an educator. And I came to Madison. I started doing my master's. I got a job at, in the department of neurology doing some administrative work and things happened. Eventually their residency coordinator left and I started working with residents. 
And honestly, I had never thought about medical training. What you all do, I just know, I was glad it happened and I took advantage of it, but I never knew like how it, how it happened. And when I started to get to know them and their lives and their struggles and joys, it, it just was intoxicating. And I'm like, I wanna do this. I wanna work in an environment where you have to learn which learning requires you to make mistakes and ask questions and to be vulnerable in an environment that when you do those things, there are life and death consequences. How do you do that? And so I've just been working with that ever since. I came to the Department of Medicine. I worked in the residency program back in 2008, I think I came, which <laughs> all of a sudden feels like a really long time ago. I worked with Bennett Vogelman, who was our program director at the time. Betsy Trowbridge was an associate program director at the time. And I was interested in seeing how I could start to really contribute in a different way, building curriculum. And Bennett said, you know, you should talk to this guy named Toby Campbell. He's a palliative care doc, and he's interested in doing some communications workshops. Did something called now called Vital Talk. I think it was Onco Talk back then. And I said, okay, sure, I'll, I'll see what, how that goes. And I started to work with him to develop these workshops. Some of you probably attended them when we did this for the department. And as I was observing the, that then residents in these encounters with the standardized patients, I realized that there was, there was definitely a, a, an intentionality around like, how do we talk about these things? How do we say what we need to say when it's really hard? But another thing they were struggling with is this idea of what I, discovered was empathy. I want to connect with my patients. I want to be there, really be there with them in that moment. But I don't want to get lost. And I don't want to be a bad doctor because I'm sobbing on the floor with them, right? So how do I do this? And I started to look in the literature and realized that actually people come into medicine pretty high on the empathy scales. And something happens during training and it goes down. And I think that it it's not necessarily something that happens, but something that doesn't happen. That we come in, we have this, the vast majority of us have a natural ability to empathize. But when you come into a clinical environment, you have to use it a little bit differently. You have to, you do need to think about yourself and how you kind of have that semi-permeable barrier, but not a wall, right? So I started this journey that I've been on ever since. I was gonna do a poll and it was gonna be amazing. You do, there was going to be a QR code and you could answer these questions. Technology wasn't my friend this morning. So, but I do want to just pose the question since we're going to be talking about empathy, which is a two way kind of connective concept. I just want to check in with y'all. People on Zoom, just kind of, how are you feeling? And maybe a couple of people in the room could just shout out, like, what's your predominant emotion at the moment? Stress, what was the other one? Contentment. <laughs> Feelings of part of my needs. Yeah, that's so nice. So it's a mixed bag, right? Yeah, we're all here, it's a Friday morning. Some of us are looking forward to the weekend. Maybe we have plans, maybe we have nothing to do. So just kind of check in with yourselves. I wish I could check in with the Zoom folks too, but. Technology. Curious, anxious, happy it's Friday, excited to see Amy, relax. Curious, anxious, happy it's Friday, excited to see Amy. Oh, relaxed. I'm glad. I hope that person's still in bed. <laughs> All right, so these are our objectives. I hope by the end of this talk, you'll be able to compare and contrast empathy and compassion. Those are often terms that are conflated or tied together. You'll be able to explore, explain the role of empathy in clinical practice, maybe in a little bit of a different way than you do now. You'll be able to incorporate this understanding into your teaching or your work. You'll be, maybe explore some ways to broaden your own empathy for those in your life, whether it's your learners, your colleagues, your loved ones. And maybe you'll imagine implementing a new technique to teach empathy. So to get there, we're gonna go over some definitions because these terms are used often, but sometimes we all have different definitions of what they mean. I'm gonna talk about some interventions and what has made successful interventions for teaching empathy. 
I'm going to talk specifically about medical improv because that's a technique that I have found to be very effective in teaching this. And then a little bit about what's next if we have time. And that clock is just broken, right? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, it's totally, I keep looking at it. I'm like, oh, time is not, time is standing still. That would be very strange. Thank you, Betsy. Okay. So first some definitions. How do you define empathy? Anyone in the room? Understanding. Understanding, love it. What else? Being able to put yourself in that person's predicament, exactly. That imagination. Feeling, we love that, like jinx, that was awesome. Feeling the experience, right? So there's an emotional component to it as well. Absolutely. So this is my definition when I was doing my PhD research, you know, they luckily force you to <laughs> cone these things down into understandable terms. So when I think about empathy, just so you know what I'm saying, what I mean when I say that, I think it's both the imaginative reconstruction of another's perspective, how's this person experiencing this, and the emotional resonance that causes in the self. So it's this part, these two pieces, a cognitive and an, and an affective component to empathy. I wanted to share a story with you. And unfortunately, in my life over the past many years, I have lost a lot of people that I loved to illness and death. So I thought about starting with that story. And honestly, it's just kind of a downer. <laughs> and I think we can all understand the utility of empathy in end of life care in you know, those family meeting situations. So I wanted to share a story with you about a more of a routine experience that I had in which I think empathy could have been really helpful. So for those of you who may not know, <laughs> Anybody know what this is? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, it's a mammography machine, right? So a few years ago, I had a weird finding on a, ma a mammogram and they wanted to do a needle biopsy. Spoiler alert, everything's fine, don't worry. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, but I'm like, okay, so you know, you go in and you do this, this biopsy and it's guided by the mammography machine. So for those of you who may not have experienced this, you, you kind of, they like contort your body in a way <laughs> so that they could have access to what they would like to look at. They tell you to breathe at certain times. It's this really hard plastic. I don't know why it has to be that way, but apparently it does. So I'm like in this machine and you know, my face is pressed up against it and they're getting ready for the procedure. And the nurse comes over and like, and the clinic actually did a nice thing where they had like this really nice painting right in my eye line. So I could kind of, you know, just imagine this scene. The nurse comes over and they talk to me and stuff like this. And then the physician comes in and guess where they stood? Like right here, <laughs> like right out of my eye line. And I think, you know, I was in a vulnerable position, so I couldn't necessarily say, you know, I can't, I can't really see you if you could just move over a little bit. Um, and, and I think that they saw me craning my neck, uh, but they just kind of stood out of the eye line and, that, and I, that's what happened. And afterwards I was like, you know, everything is very profound and very powerful. It can be very impactful and it can be so simple as just thinking about what's the perspective, literal, visual perspective of my patient, and am I standing in the right place? Or do I need to move 10 feet over, right? So we talk about sitting down, sitting eye line, and sometimes this is just really simple. So I just wanted to make that point, that what I'm talking about is very profound and can sometimes be very simple and don't, not take a lot of time, right? It wouldn't have taken that much time to have that person move over. The fellow who had to hold pressure for, I feel like an hour after the needle biopsy, amazing, kind, chatted, you know, let's talk about it. So there was definitely a, a good experience in that as well. 
But when we think about empathy too, a lot of times we think about empathy and compassion together. So this is a, a study that was published a few years ago in the Palliative Medicine Environment by Sinclair. And they, were, they did a bunch of qualitative interviews of clinicians and patients to figure out how do these interact in the palliative care environment. And what they really saw was that, so you'll see like this little end of a circle here, that's sympathy. I don't have time to talk about sympathy, but if you're interested in the difference between sympathy and empathy, there's a great Brene Brown video. If you just Google sympathy, empathy, Brene Brown, it'll come up. Um, but empathy seems to be this space that we enter. So we're imagining the other person's perspective. We're resonating with that emotion. If that person is suffering, if that's the predominant emotion, then we move into this space of compassion. So oftentimes in medicine, as you can imagine, people talk about compassion with empathy because a lot of your experiences with patients and family members, they are suffering. And so you can move into this compassionate space, but empathy is that gateway. And then when we think about compassion more specifically, it's really opening up this relational space. So it's a space between two individuals to try and figure out how can I be of service? How can I help in this time of suffering? It's not about fixing it. It's not about glossing it over. It's really about attending to that person and trying to figure out how you can be helpful. And sometimes the best thing that you can do, the only thing that you can do is just be there and to be in that discomfort with them. As humans, we're social creatures. We need each other quite literally. So sometimes it's just about being there. Compassion is also really interesting because although it's oriented towards suffering, it itself is a positive emotion. So emotion researchers will study negative and positive emotions on kind of this binary. And compassion does a lot of the same things for us as contentment or joy, even though it's geared towards suffering. So there's a lot of great compassion research out there, but I'm not gonna talk about it too much more. <laughs> Back to empathy. So this is a just a more fleshed out definition. It's also tied to a measure. So I think that, you know, when I do these talks in other places, people are like, how do you even measure that? And it's really difficult. You know, it's not like you can do a blood test and say, okay, your empathy level is this or, or an MRI, right? So we have these great psychologists who over time have created these psychometric tools to try and figure out how to measure it. And this is one that was created by Mark Davis back in the 80s and is used all over the place. And it's the Interpersonal Reactivity Index. And so Dr. Davis divides empathy into these four domains. So we talked a little bit about perspective taking. There's also fantasy, which is this, you can think of it as like fictional empathy. Like how much do I really identify with somebody in a book or in a movie? And then there's the more emotional concepts of empathic concern or those feelings of warmth and compassion and then personal distress. So how much of that do I, how much somebody's anxiety or stress do I take on myself? And what's interesting is that over time, if you look at study after study, as people's perspective taking fantasy and empathic concern go up, their personal distress actually goes down. So there's something about engaging in these skills of empathy that can help protect us as well from some of that suffering. This is the care measure. So the IRI is meant to be taken by the individual. The care measure is for patients. And I usually don't use this version, but I love it. So <laughs> this is the pediatric version of the care measure. I just love the pictures. But it's really about you know, asking the patients, did, did the physician make you feel at ease? Did they let you tell your horse story without interrupting and things like that? So really getting at those behavioral components of empathy as far as the other person is observing them. When we talk about perspective taking too, I think sometimes it's hard to differentiate our perspective from another's perspective. So this is a great paper that was put out by Jeffrey. He's over in the UK. He does a lot of this research. And he really thinks we should start using the term other oriented perspective taking. So it's not necessarily how I would view a situation, but how would you view this situation? And I wanted to pause on this for just a moment because I think it's really difficult 
especially when there are a lot of cultural differences between two people, right? So I'm asking you, I'm saying you need to imagine how someone might be looking at the situation. And we all know that we all walk through this world with very different experiences based on different identity characteristics that we have. So I wanna acknowledge that it's a leap. There are some studies that show that if you are basing your imaginative perception of their experience on stereotypes, and not actual experience with folks that can be really damaging. So the more that we live in a segregated world, the harder it is to, to make that leap sometimes, but it's not impossible. I don't think, I hope, <laughs> I don't think it is, but I did wanna make that point. There's a great, come on in. Yeah, come on in, welcome. Yeah, hi. And this is the worst, right? Having these doors here. But yeah, welcome. All right, so Helen Reese, who actually came and did Grand Rounds years ago, an amazing researcher at Mass General, she has an empathy lab and she has defined empathy in these ways. So you're, you're sort of perceiving what the other, what you're seeing the other experience, you're processing that and then you're responding in some way. So there's also that response that, that is, is important with empathy. So you're communicating with the other person that you're empathizing with them. Um, what it's not. So a lot of people think, oh, empathy is just being nice. It's not. I'm being nice is good. <laughs> being kind definitely has some benefits. Um, but sometimes that's not the point of it. Just being nice. Um, it's also not feeling every feeling, right? So there's this, there are empaths that kind of just are sponges for everything that's going on around them. And empathy, again, there's this, this idea of, of a barrier, of a, some boundaries around that. It's also not reassurance and silver lining everything and everything's gonna be okay. That just, that's not true to the situation sometimes. What it does in the clinical environment is so many positive things. <laughs> so huge gratitude to Dr. Mariah Quinn, who's our chief wellness officer at UW Health. It used to be my co-collaborator. It still is in the empathy course that I'll talk about later. And a systematic review that came back out in 2021. So many good things. So this, a lot of these are just relationship factors in general include patient recall and comprehension, loyalty, satisfaction with care. The ones with the asterisks are empathy specific. So physician outcomes, in increased diagnostic accuracy, lower burnout, lower malpractice claims, which are also really important for institutions, right? So it's gonna be a really powerful tool for patients, clinicians, family members, pretty much everybody. Can it be taught though? Can you teach people? Of course, you know what my answer would be. But just a moment to pause. So in the room, how many people think that you can teach this, but probably only to children? Okay. I think this is a good crowd. <laughs> How many people think you just can't teach it? Yeah, maybe not. There's a medical educator in Ireland who thinks, yeah, these are immovable characteristics. Lynn. Yeah, so it's teach are teaching tools and strategies to enhance the same as teaching empathy. So if somebody's starting at zero, can you? It's a good question. Maybe not. Right. So this and some people have started to use the term nurturing empathy because it's not like we're teaching it from ground zero. So that's a good point. Well, let's see. Let's see what folks have done to do this. So huge gratitude to these amazing researchers who put out three systematic reviews in the past two years. When I was doing my PhD research, oh, I wish these were here. <laughs> it's amazing. So there's been some, there's, these are great papers if you're interested in looking at specific studies, I would definitely suggest looking them up and I can send them out as well. 
I wanted to distill them a little bit for you all. So when you think about when they looked across these studies to what really works, these were the bottom line points. This training needs to be experiential for it to really stick as opposed to didactic. So like what I'm doing now, right? So people need to experience something. A little bit of didactics was okay and some foundational definitions like we just went over was helpful. Multiple modalities, multiple methods. So doing one method in a study didn't necessarily see the outcome they wanted to see as opposed to doing multiple things because people are different and they're starting from different places. So figuring out how you can include multiple modalities in a teaching intervention. Important that it happens over time. You know, it's like, wouldn't it be great if we could just do a one-off two-hour workshop? Empathy, boom, there we go. Uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no pill that you can take yet. Well, yeah, probably not. Um, encouraging self-awareness is important. So it's an other-oriented skill set. And we're always going to be in the equation. So having some sort of self-awareness piece of the curriculum is really helpful. And the medical humanities are extremely useful in this endeavor. What we do here in the empathy course, this is Dr. Quinn, who I mentioned earlier, we started this course back in 2015 with our residents. And we have luckily did a lot of the things that were effective. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good thing. Uh, these are some of our past residents. You might see some familiar faces here. We take them off of clinical rotations, put them in a room and do a lot of fun stuff together. Um, we also go over to the art museum. Dr. Quinn is trained in visual thinking strategies. And so we use the art there to really help unpack some of these issues. Um, I think Mariah calls it the spaghetti method where you just throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. And so for a lot of our trainees, this isn't their jam, <laughs> but maybe something else is, right? So I don't really wanna go to the museum, but I wanna do some reflective writing and talk about it. Uh, we also do some improv. So improv, which I'll talk about later in more depth is really helpful in getting at those behavioral aspects of empathy and really how do you put this into action? And then we do some mindfulness uh, meditation. So we worked with Lisa Grant did some yoga, very light, um, nothing too strenuous. And we talk about emotions and what they are and what they're for. Because that's sometimes it's another thing that I noticed coming from a, a theater background where it's all, you know, it's all about emoting. Like, can I cry on cue? And how, do, how does this feel? And what's my motivation? And then in the clinical environment, emotions were almost like not to be talked about in a way or a little bit dangerous or would get in the way of clinical practice. In the empathy course, we also go over nurse statements. So some of you are probably familiar with these. Um, this is a nurse shark, by the way, in case you're wondering, why is there a shark? <laughs> uh, so these are ways that you can express, express your empathy, right? Just naming what you're seeing. Like, I can see this is really sad or, acknowledging what you're getting from the other person, understanding statements or seeking to understand, supporting. I wish statements can be really powerful as well. I wish this wasn't the situation that we were in. And silence. Sometimes not saying anything is the most appropriate thing to say. We also still do We Talk workshops for our senior residents, usually our PG2s. So we get a group of actors who are amazing to come in and play different characters in different cases and then we go through in a small group have them interact with the actor do some timeouts see how much they might be able to tweak their communication a little bit to make that more effective and we also talk to them about self-compassion and we've been joined this year by our chief resident sarah floden in a lot of these sessions which has been awesome um, and open to other people who want to collaborate as well <laughs> So all of these things that we talk about, you know, compassion for others, they can also be turned on yourself. We're all human. We all deserve this. And so we teach residents how to, how to think about that as well, because it can be very helpful for resilience. 
We also run a palliative medicine workshop. So we've been doing this also, I guess since 2014, uh, started out as a small group, sort of regional palliative medicine fellowships and has grown a lot over time. I will see some familiar faces there, Sarah Johnson, Ethan Silverman, who's a former palliative medicine fellow, Toby's up there. And then our colleagues from Northwestern, University of Minnesota, Mayo and Indiana University are up there as well. So a lot of fun. We do use the care measure to see if there are some changes pre to post. So it's a, about a three day workshop and we have found increases in folks care measures over time. And I had the pleasure of working with this group of people, Liana Escola, Sarah Rogers and Ethan Silverman and we did an interprofessional we talk over at the VA. Like right before I think it was the end of 2019. So it's taken us a while to analyze this data, <laughs> but we are working on a manuscript. So look for that because we also found some increases in care measures in that workshop as well. So we talked about definitions, interventions that have worked, some of the work that we are doing here at University of Wisconsin. And now I'm going to specifically talk about medical improv, because as I said earlier, this is a tool and a strategy that I have found to be extremely effective in teaching empathy. Probably not a surprise that I came from a theater background and am now incorporating this into my research. But one thing that might be surprising if you don't know, so we often think about improv as theatrical, comedic, whose line is it anyway? This is Viola Spolin. She's the reason we have improv in the United States. She's sort of the grandmother of it all. She actually picked up a lot of those techniques from the whole house in Chicago from a social worker named Neva Boyd. So Neva was a researcher and a social worker, and she was really interested in children learning through play. She was at the whole house, which was, you know, a place for, for folks to come. A lot of immigrants from different countries came to the whole house. Parents would go off and work during the day. The kids would be at the whole house, and she was in charge of children's programming there. And Viola, who was a theater artist, really saw the potential of what Neva was doing for actors. She said, you know, if we can teach actors to work together in this way, to be spontaneous, they'll be better at their craft. So she took that and took it to the theater. Her son, Paul Sills, started Second City in Chicago. Her granddaughter, Aretha Sills, still teaches Viola Spolin's method on Zoom and in Door County of all places. So if you're interested, there are a lot of great workshops in Door County uh, and all over the country. So this thing that we often associate with theater actually came from social work. And now we're taking it back and we're applying it in many different fields, one of them being medicine. So this is Katie Watson. She is a bioethicist and an improv teacher and a reproductive rights lawyer and a medical humanities professor, like one of those superhuman people. Several of you are also in the room. Uh, but she started a playing doctor course. So she was working in Northwestern Medical School and teaching at Second City and said, oh, maybe this could be useful. So she started this course 20 years ago and published a paper in academic medicine with some preliminary findings, which basically said, you know, medical students really like this. 100% would recommend this to other medical students. And it helps me take risks. It helps me feel more confident. It helps make me a better doctor. And I think the reason why this is an effective method and why this happens to people who do improv in this way is that one of the tenets that Viola Spolin really put forth in her book was that as humans, and maybe especially as adults, we always are thinking in this approval disapproval way. Before we make any action, we're, we're wondering like, how is this gonna go? Are you gonna judge me? If I talk about a mammogram, is that the best way to start a talk, right? What is gonna happen? And when we do this, when we get locked into this approval disapproval thinking, we lock ourselves out from what she says. We keep ourselves from a fresh moment of experience and rarely go beyond what we already know. It's too risky. We want to stay here where we're going to be protected. And we lose the ability to be organically involved in a problem 
And in a disconnected way, we function with only parts of our total selves. So we cut ourselves off from all of this that we could have access to. So improv and improv activities and games have these little rules within them that help unlock this, that help us to get out of that approval, disapproval thinking just a little bit. And I will say it doesn't happen class one. So I teach a class here, it's six weeks long. We meet once a week for two and a half hours. By the third week, I think this is starting to kick in. This is starting to gel. So it, it, it has to happen over time is what I'm saying. With that in mind though, I think it would be fun to have you all in the room and on Zoom by audience um, experience just a taste, just a taste of this. So we are going to explore this rule of improv, which is called yes and. Has anyone in the room heard of this rule? Yeah, a lot of people write yes and. So what does yes and mean? Taking what someone says at face value and then advancing it. Exactly, taking what someone says at face value and advancing it in some way. Perfect. So we are going to do this in the room by passing a mic around. <laughs> And do you think we could get like all the way? I think everybody's in reach of at least one other person that we could, okay. So we are going to, do you mind um, starting us off, Betsy? Wait, 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 me start. So we are gonna plan a party together for some sort of occasion. What's an occasion we should plan this party for? Valentine's Day. We're gonna plan a Valentine's Day party in the room. And the way that it's gonna go is everybody's gonna contribute one thing. So Betsy will start us out and then we'll go to Lynn and Shobi and we'll just go around whoever's easiest for you to pass the mic and you're gonna contribute one thing. So I might say, let's have cookies and somebody could say, yes, and let's da -da -da -da, whatever. So you'll just start with yes and. So I think we should have um, Valentine's cupcakes that are pink um, cake and red frosting. And rum. And rum. Yes, and Diet Coke. Yes, and coffee. Yes, and a day off of work. <laughs> yes, and an option for those who are on a diet. Yes, and fancy chocolate. Yes, and heart-shaped balloons. Yes, and a hot cup of tea. Yes, and an adult-sized bouncy house. <laughs> yes, and bring the UW band. Yes, and a petting zoo. Uh, some nice dinner. Yes, and a good kiss. <laughs> Yes, and we should bring significant others. Yes, and beer that's not spotted cow. Yes, and let's make those cupcakes gluten-free. Yes, and cheesecake. Uh, yes, and Valentine's for the patients. Yes, and let's do crafts. Uh, yes, and let's do fireworks as well. <laughs> yes, and after the fireworks are done, let's let's have some puppies. Yes. yes, and free chair massages. And a string quartet. Woo! Very well done. <laughs> Like a great party. Would you have all, would, would any of you individually have thought of all of those things? No. no. Right? So in, in a class, we would do, there's a different activity that we do to kind of juxtapose this with other ways you might start, like yes, but or no. 
And then we unpack it. What does this have to do with your work? What does this have to do with your life? Any, just, if not, that's okay. But in the room, anything that like, oh, okay, this, I could apply this yes and thing to this part of my life. Anyone? Everybody talking, saying any words during a meeting, getting that like input. Alex. Yes, if your wife wants waffles and you want bacon. Oh, it's the best, right? A little sweet and savory. Absolutely. I think in relationships, this can be really handy. All right. Well, thank you all for participating and for Zoomies for uh, enjoying that and imagining this party that we might have. So just a few more in depth about what I think medical improv does. So Belinda Fu, who's an amazing improviser, physician, artist in Seattle has this model for what, it's just so amazing that people, improv is such an oral tradition that I just am so grateful for folks who publish models like this so that we can build on them. So she really thinks that improv has these three elements. You're attuning, kind of get in the feel of what's going on. You're affirming, so you're saying yes. And you're advancing. You're including some information from your perspective that could advance the situation. And what I've done in my work, and gratitude to Kara Westmus, who created this figure to help me explain this, what I've done is embedded Helen Reese's empathy model into Belinda Fu's improv model. Because I think if we can, while we're perceiving, if we're really attuning what's going on with me and you, while we're processing, if we're doing that in an affirming way, and what I mean by that is suspending judgment just a little, because it's hard for me. <laughs> Somebody, especially if I disagree, that judgment gets right in. But if I can suspend that a little bit as I process what I'm getting, and then when I'm responding, I'm doing that in a way that enriches that situation for everybody involved. So I put this model to the test. I got a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to study my course, which is Interprofessional Improv. You might see a couple familiar faces, Joan Addington White, who was a former physician here, Julia Yates, who's a family medicine pr provider, and then Paula Drozemski is a professor in nursing who retired a couple of years ago. But we got a group of people together, started this class, and I was really interested in, again, like measuring something. What, what is going on? I feel like something's happening with this improv stuff, but how do I prove it? So I got a research team together, which included theater artist Norma Saldivar, qualitative researcher and human factors engineer, Sarah Kramer, Linda Park, who's still here in family medicine, Bonnie Schoenlieber, amazing research coordinator, as you can imagine, and Faye Osman, who's our statistician. And we got we had an intervention group of about 45. We had a, a comparison group, not really a control, of about 41 students, and we measured pre-post. We used a care measure, and I used a modified care measure because I was really interested in interprofessional empathy. So not necessarily with patient care, but how do you work with your colleagues? And do you help your colleagues feel at ease? Do you help them contribute without interrupting and really telling the whole, their whole story? And we saw increases in the intervention group versus the comparison group. We also did some interviews. Dr. Kramer did some qualitative interviews for us. And I don't have time to read the second quote, but um, I do have time to read the first one. <laughs> so. The improv stuff, which I just kind of love that conceptualization. The improv stuff helps you feel comfortable responding to a situation and trusting yourself that you're going to figure something out. Again, getting out of that approval, disapproval thinking, I'm going to jump in. It's going to be scary. It's going to be vulnerable. I'm going to do it anyway. And oftentimes I see a benefit from doing that. The next quote is really about how it helps in your personal life. So oftentimes I'll have people write reflections after the course is done. And a lot of times they talk about their work. They also talk about their lives. And I think that's great. Secondary outcomes are welcome. Because again, this can be applied broadly. Uh, in 2020, we all know what happened. <laughs> we, I transitioned my course to Zoom. And these are some amazing medical students that helped me figure out how to do that. I was always a skeptic when it came, people would come to me and like, oh, how do you get this online? How do you do this asynchronous? And I would say, you can't, no way. Uh, I was wrong. It actually works really well. So we transitioned this very personal interactive medium to Zoom and had a lot of fun doing it. 
So, so much fun. And with encouragement from Faye Osman, our wonderful statistician, she said, how can we do this in a little bit more rigorous way? How can we do a randomized control trial of Zoom improv? And I said, well, let's figure it out. And luckily, not really, because the pandemic in no way is good. But the challenge came to us. I got an innovation grant from the Department of Medicine in 2020 to do this randomized control trial. Was going to do it. 2020, we all know what happened. So in 2022, I finally felt like I was able to do this on Zoom, thanks to a lot of experimentation on how to figure out how to do this. And to this amazing team, Maya Amjadi, who's an MSCP student here at UW, Faye Osman, you all know, and Jackie Kosabuk, who is a PhD student in the information school. So she's really interested in library and information sciences. So we recruited medical students. We randomized them to either take the Zoom improv, which we shortened. So my class is about 15 hours. We halved it. So it's 7.5 hours of Zoom improv. And then the control group just had usual training. We measured, I love using mixed methods. So we did some interpersonal reactivity index scores. We also did a focus group and Jackie came to every session and took field notes throughout the class so that we could capture some of the emergent topics that were coming up when, after we did these activities. This is preliminary data. We're still kind of working through it to figure it out. But I think it's really interesting. Now you'll see the sample size is small. So this is a pilot study. If anybody knows a great funder, let me know. We could do a bigger one. So there was some differences when you look at the improv group versus the control group. And you'll see in the control group, those measures, perspective taking, fantasy, empathic concern all went down. So this is the net change from pre to post and the personal distress went up. So that's kind of the opposite of what we wanna see, right? And the improv group, there was some protection there. We were interested too, because usually, so Katie Watson's course is first year, maybe second year, it's early medical school. We took all comers. So we were interested, does this impact early medical students? So we split them years one and two or beyond. And there were some differences in, in the impact. So thinking about when should this training happen, ideally over time, but if we can't get it into the medical school curriculum early, maybe we should try to put it in there later because there's some more detrimental effects. It seems like not having this in later years. Very preliminary qualitative results. I don't know if many of you have done qualitative research, but we're at that like really uncomfortable point where we've coded everything and now we're going through and that first level analysis is so weird and mushy. <laughs> but, but I did wanna share a couple of things with you. I mean, a lot of the themes that came out, one of the codes that we had was flexibility and adaptability. And I just love this quote from one of the medical students talking about working in a rural medicine program. You know, you have to work with what you got because you don't have all the resources. Sometimes it ends up being better than if you had the entire world in front of you. And they also talk about fun. So medical students and perhaps some of you in the room often think of fun over here and learning over here. And it's like polar opposites. So they're surprised sometimes when, when it was like fun to learn or having people agree with what they say. You know, it's definitely felt good to feel heard. Sometimes you can not feel as heard or things get lost in translation. It was nice to say something and have people agree with me on it. It was fun, but I wouldn't say it was easy. So that also comes up, right? It's nerve wracking to do this. A lot of people, when they say improv, how many of you, when I say we're gonna do some improv, feel nervous? Yeah. <laughs> you look like, like controlled and planning and you put them into this environment. They're like, whoa. Yeah, it's scary and, and fun. So a lot of times too, I'll have students saying, I wasn't gonna do this, but I'm really glad I did. <laughs> and I just love that. And you can see that happen over time in class too, people who are really not sure. And then, wow, they really come into their own. So it's really fun. This idea is spreading. So back in 2019, a group of people 
we came together with, I came together with Belinda Fu, Dan Sip, John Michael Morey, and Bree Tierno, who are up at the top there. And we started to say, you know, how can we reach out and get some people together? Maybe at our institution, there's only one or two of us who are doing this medical improv. So how can we help each other? So we started the Medical Improv Collaborative and it has grown, I think we're up to maybe 50 members at this point. People who are doing this work across the country in different contexts, all in healthcare, but in nursing and social work and pediatrics and surgery. It's been really fun to get to know these folks and get together and, and have some ideas and collaboration. We just did a, what's called a nominal group technique to try and figure out where these tools are best suited, like what skills should we use medical improv to teach? And that was led by Carolyn Chan in the brick wall here. She's a medical education fellow at Yale and Krista Longton, who is over at uh, Indiana University. And we're gonna, we have, that's being reviewed now in patient education and counseling. Cause I think people, it's a great tool. It's very powerful. Sometimes we ask it to do things it's not really appropriate for. <laughs> so really figuring out what those boundaries are and how we can be helpful to people who wanna use these techniques. I do wanna leave time for questions. So this is gonna be really brief. But when I think about what's next, what's immediately next for me is I'm starting my improvisational theater for scientists course. So in the fall, I teach improv for health professionals. In the spring, I teach improv for scientists. And I'm always open to auditors. So if anybody in this room or on Zoom, if you're in Wisconsin, <laughs> you can come and take the class. It's really fun. Uh, healthcare professionals, we focus our debriefs when we talk about how this relates to our work on clinical care. And for scientists, we talk about science communication. How do you connect with an audience? How do you talk about your work that may seem very ethereal or, you know, like, why are you studying this to people and really make that connection? So it's, it's a lot of fun. And there's a great group of people at University of Chicago led by Marshall Chin. There's some great, they have another paper that just came out in academic medicine not too long ago. But how can we use these techniques? And they broaden it to include stand-up comedy, graphic medicine, theater of the oppressed. How can we use this to address some really important problems that we have in patient care and medical education, like racism? Is this a tool that we can use to advance some of our thinking and our behaviors in that way? And in my own work, I've been really interested in this as well. And there's another technique called playback theater which includes some improv and some storytelling. And so I'm really interested in how we might be able to build capacity around these skills using multiple theater methods. All right, so by now, maybe you have a little different, maybe not, but a different understanding of empathy and compassion and how they relate to each other. You can explain the role of empathy in clinical practice, maybe in a nuanced way. Ex incorporate some of this understanding into your teaching or your lives. Explore ways to broaden your own empathy. Maybe take an improv class. Imagine implementing one new technique to teach empathy. Huge amount of gratitude. My path was not laid out for me. I had a lot of support and encouragement and advice and you know just all of the above from this group of people. Not everybody is on this slide. I hope you know who you are when I say thank you for everything that you've done to help me foster this career that I love so much. And thank you all for your time and attention. You want me to go back? Okay, <laughs> thank you all for your time, your attention, your participation. Uh, it's been amazing. I love my work and I love sharing it with people. So I'm so glad to see you and to see you on Zoom. I can imagine you in your bathrobes and feeding your dogs. Uh, so thank you so much. Also, I am, as Dr. Trowbridge mentioned, I'm the Director of Education, Innovation, and Scholarship in the department. So if you're interested in doing some similar work, contact me, get a hold of me, uh, no matter where you are, even if you're not in the Department of Medicine. Um, we, let's help each other. Let's figure out how we can make this training even better than it already is. A few references, they're also on the slides, and I'm happy to send things to people. And questions. <laughs> Fantastic. So I am going to start out with the first question, which is um, 
you know, as a general internist and someone who leads general internists, you talked about those um, David's four domains. And when you get to the domain of empathic concern and then personal distress, what I see internists coming out of training with is that inability to put up some sort of a barrier to personal distress so they're consumed by other people's sadness and problems. So, you know, thoughts about, um, obviously you have some tools here that we could use. And so how would we go about doing that? Seems like psychiatry does a, quite a good job of teaching that. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Can you still hear me on here? Um, and the, you mentioned psychiatry. And so maybe there's something we can learn from them as well. So some of that collaboration could be really helpful. But I honestly just think it takes a lot of practice, a lot of practice to figure out how to do that. How do you get, and there's this great study, it's a qualitative study that came out years ago and they, they termed this exquisite empathy. And they really talk about how do you get so close to that patient's story without getting lost in it. And they talked to, actually it was psychologists, trauma therapists, and it just over time developing those strategies and what works for you. So ways to really connect and draw yourself back. And it just is this sort of muscle that you have to build over time and figure that out. Thank you. Um, question, I'm gonna go around the audience and then I'll go online. Dr. Schnapp. Great talk. So as you were talking, I was thinking about leadership training and you know, we do a lot, for example, in, in conflict management and understanding somebody else's perspective. Have you thought about taking your principles and, of empathy and improvisation and applying them um, for more leadership training uh, programs? That's a great idea. And perhaps maybe that's like on the horizon. There are other groups of people who are doing just that. Um, so yeah, I would love, I think they're these, again, these skills are so transferable and thinking about the problems that we have to solve. How can we get more people involved? So I think that's a great idea. Okay, and I'm just gonna come up over here. I feel like I'm a talk show. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hi, Amy, that was wonderful. Um, so my question is about, you know, you talk a lot about um, empathy being this kind of like growth continuum. It's not just this like clinical check mark competency that you can get in training. Um, I was just wondering if you've, and you mentioned too, like the earlier, the better that you start it in your training. Have you done any research in sort of like what it looks like kind of in a later career starting this? And, you know, especially outside of the like infrastructure of a training program, what that would look like? I think that's a great idea. I haven't done research in that area. The, the closest that we've gotten is for Pally Talk, we have a fellows course, and then we also have a practicing clinicians course. So some of that data comes from that group. Um, and then what we did when we in the department, we did we talk for the whole department. So we had some of that data as well. But it'd be interesting to see like longitudinally almost, right? Like what happens if you do or do not have this kind of training or later on in your career. I think that's a great project that we should work together on, Gabby. <laughs> I know we have some online, but also we still have some audience questions. Um, okay, let me just go down here. Thanks, Betsy. All right, Dr. Chita. Thank you, Amy. It's always inspirational to listen to you. Um, one of the things I've been reflecting on is kind of the balance we put between um, educating about science and educating about art, if we all accept that the profession is combined science and art. And um, I think part of it is convincing ourselves and people that you actually can teach parts of these things that are, are more in that art realm. I'd be interested in hearing about your observations about how we balance teaching science and art in medicine across the entire continuum, because I think that was an excellent point that was just made about it's just not in training. Uh, I think that's such a great question. And one of the other things we're really finding in our data from the improv course is are these binaries, right? So this binary between science and art and how can we start to meld that? How can we see empathy as a clinical skill, right? in a way that not takes away from it, 
but helps it to be put on that a similar level. So I think part of it is values and messaging. And I think another part is collaboration, right? So I think that you all, we all are really great at teaching the science part and maybe we need some help teaching the art part. So maybe it's reaching across to theater artists or psychiatry or whoever. So some of it might also be getting more brains on the problem. Okay, online, uh, uh, Sharon Hansen, amazing presentation. Ann Gravel Sullivan from the past, very inspiring. Dr. Zelensky, there are so many um, ways that we can use this. Um, uh, Brett Thompson, Amy and everyone, very excited to hear about medical empathy. Um, and then one qu um, question here, we have one more, which is, and Dr. Bartles, thank you for sharing your terrific work. Pete Guest, is there evidence that empathy is opposed to understanding a patient is necessary to delivering effective medical care? That is a great question. And there are two components to that. There's evidence that it might not matter to that patient, whether you empathize or whether you understand and deliver great care. There's evidence that it will help the clinician if it's empathy. So again, when we, when we have compassion, we kind of get this benefit from that positive emotion, which is different from if we're acting out of obligation. So there's, I usually talk about this, but there's two different studies we can like look at in juxtaposition. So it probably doesn't help the person, it probably doesn't matter to the person being helped, but it matters to the helper to build resilience. And this will be the last question. And uh, so from Faye Osman, Amy, can you touch on how our institutions systems can support growth of empathy in our practitioners as they come in with the abundance of empathy, but that degrades over time? So many ways that we could do this. That's a great question. I think the one thing that comes to mind, and this was, um, there was a theory paper that was put out just last year by a group of international researchers thinking about this concept. And the one, like one of the predominant things that can shut down our empathy and our other orientation is pressure and fear. So if we're pressured to get things done quickly, if we're afraid of something, that will focus ourselves on ourselves, which is makes sense because we're sort of in survival mode. So if there are ways that institutions can lift that, can, <laughs> can, I don't know what that means, but that's the thing that comes to mind is people need to be able to care and not be focused completely on themselves. We're going to send you all the kudos. There were kudos also from uh, Dr. Quinn, um, Brent Bentley Thompson, and several other people who you know from nationally. So congratulations. Great talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all so much.